Today on Revelation to Transformation, Paul says here that the whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over that, the sins that were previously committed. How about that? Let's go to the fifth chapter. Verse 9. Justification. One of my favorite subjects. Romans 5. Uh, what is meant by the term salvation? And what are some ways to effectively share your faith with others? Pastor Paul White was recently asked to submit six 30-minute sermons aimed at an audience of unbelievers in order to introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. These sermons are currently airing on an international Christian satellite network with a potential audience of over one billion people. Now you can own these six sermons on DVD as study tools for effective evangelism or share them with friends and loved ones who need to hear the good news about God's love and Christ's sacrifice. This six DVD set can be yours for only $30 plus $5 shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or order online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. The number five is widely regarded as the Hebrew number that represents God's grace. It is no coincidence that there are exactly five women named in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus found in the first book of the New Testament. Each of these five women represent God's grace and favor in various ways and at different times in our own lives. Pastor Paul White delivers five sermons in this series covering the stories of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. This series is available to you for only $20 plus shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. ...preaching to the lost, but it's always intriguing to me to just take the Bible now and to be able to open it up and say, let's look into some things in the Scriptures now as a Christian and see if there's some things we can develop and grow in. If you're there in Luke chapter 22, let's look in verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down, talking about Jesus and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until... It is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I want to stop here in this because in this little part of this introduction here, Jesus is taking the Passover that uh, with the disciples here, this is talking about the lamb that will be, they will eat the herbs and the different spices and the different things that are, that they're told out of the book of Exodus chapter 12 that they, when they came through the Exodus, then after they have this meal, this is the reason why he's eating this meal. But there's a couple things here that Jesus says that I want to draw attention to just, just for a moment as we start. He said in verse 16, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is the last time this is ever going to be done and there's a reason for it. They may not know now what it is. Then he took the, then he took the cup and said something of this nature in verse 18. And I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. There won't be any more need of either one of these things, this Passover meal, like this until, because the kingdom of God is shortly to come. Now let's look at the rest of this chapter, in verse, or rather verse 19 on down to verse about 20 here. He says this, And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you to do this in remembrance of me. He'd already told them, I'm going to suffer. Likewise, he also took the cup after uh, supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed 
for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Now I want to, I want to stop here because we take communion at least once a month in the house with the other believers. Now you may take it sometime, you know, in your home. I have been known to, if I wasn't feeling well, if I got up with a cup of coffee and, and a cookie, I just uh, pretended I was uh, taking communion then. Now, some may say that's wrong, I don't know. I just know that if I wasn't feeling well, I just said, Lord, I'm going to pretend this is the same cup you gave that night. And this cookie here, I'll take a bite of and say, this is the body. But I think the significance here is, as I have put on the screen here, is the, uh, what, what I want to talk about tonight. And that is our inheritance, the blood, the, what he has done for us in, in, in the cross. Uh, so I want to tell a story tonight that will kind of set us up for what I want to say tonight about our inheritance, about what he's done for us, the covenant, the blood, the inheritance. And I want to go back about a thousand and fifty years before Christ ever came to the earth, and that's the time of kings. Saul was the first king of Israel, and the people really elected Saul because the scripture tells us because he's a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. They had seen all the other uh, kingdoms around them uh, select kings, and they wanted a king. They really had the best of both worlds, I think, because they were living under a theocracy in which that God ruled them through the judges. And the judges would say something, and they felt God was saying, or through the prophets. But they, this didn't seem to satisfy Israel, so they elected their first, their first king, and his name was Saul. Now, I'm not going to deal a lot with Saul, but I want to say this. Saul had a son, and his name was Jonathan. In Saul's early years of being a king, uh, he was in war with the Philistines, and there was a giant by the name of Goliath, as you well know the story. And uh, I can see in, as he, Goliath walked back and forth in the valley, he would look up to the, to the Israel there, and he would see a Saul and his army, and he would just, he, 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 what he'd done, he said, I challenge you, send me one man out. Let's save some bloodshed, send one man out, and we'll just solve this. If I win, then you guys will follow me, or you will at least recognize my kingship. But if I lose, then the Philistines will recognize your kingship. Saul had a lot of strong men, a lot of uh, good soldiers, but there was nobody that was willing to go out and face Goliath. Every day, Goliath would come out and say these same things. It's kind of like the Goliaths of our, of our everyday walk. The people that's always saying something about, well, if you really loved God, or if you really believed in this message that you're talking about, or if you really believed the Bible, or if you really think that, that God loves you, then you would do this or that or the other. Always challenging your belief. Goliath seemed to do this every day, and no one seemed to be moved. Little David was the youngest son of Jesse. One day Jesse told David, he said, I want you to go where your brothers are in battle and I want you to, uh, to go and take, them these, take the boys these, this food and, and some refreshments and see how they're doing and come back to me and tell me. When David goes, that's what he intended to do. When he got there, he heard Goliath and he heard Goliath's remarks what he was saying to Israel and there's something about being alone with God and knowing God and someone that just hears of God and knowing of him. You see there's David knew God and he, he got to know God by being alone with him. Now I'm not talking about a, a regiment of works in which that David was going to try to work out but something that he knew about God. He knew that he knew God was real because as a young shepherd boy He's seen God move in his life. Uh, there was one time when he was out herding the sheep, there was a lion that was uh, causing problems and he took care of it. And a bear, or whatever the case may be that came along, David seemed to have the answer because he got along with God and he had a confidence in who he was in the Father. When David walks up on the battlefield and he hears Goliath, He's not thinking like everybody else is thinking. There's something different about David because David has a relationship. When you know the Father, 
and you, the, you know the Father loves you and He knows you, then it makes a whole lot of difference in how you handle the situations in front of you. And that's what David did. He heard Goliath. He challenged Goliath. He went down and we know the story. He was able to, to slay Goliath and, and cut off his head, take his armor, take his sword. And, but the story doesn't stop there that I want to go to because David's initiative, uh, initiative to go ahead and do what he did, Saul made him uh, kind of an outstanding man in his, in his army. Saul, the king of Israel, the first king of Israel. Saul wasn't doing everything he needed to do as a king. He was very, really being disobedient to God in very many ways. And Saul reached a highlight of his disobedience when he went to take a country one time and he saved the king and he saved the cattle and he saved cer certain things like this. And God had told him, I want you to kill everything and everybody. Saul didn't. So when Samuel, being the prophet at that time, heard it, he said, God has removed the kingdom from you and gave it to another. The one that God had gave the kingdom to was David, and it didn't take a whole long time for this news to travel even to the king Saul. So when David walks up, even as a young teenage boy, Saul questions, who are you? I'm the son of Jesse, and where did you come from? I come from such and such. Saul begins to put it all together. But then when he slays Goliath and he takes him into his kingdom, he finds David has some talents that he loves. He can play the harp and Saul is uh, troubled in many ways. And when David plays the harp, Saul seems to settle down. It just soothes his troubled soul, you know. But as time goes on, Saul sees this young David and his own son, Jonathan. They become good friends. So much good friends that Jonathan kindly yields his allegiance to David, realizing Jonathan realizes that David's going to be the next king of Israel, but he knows his dad's the king of Israel, so what do you do? He kindly makes an alliance. He makes a covenant with, with David. Jonathan does. One day David is talking to Jonathan. He says, I don't think your dad cares too much for me, and I think if he could, he'd kill me. Jonathan said, no, you're wrong there. My dad would never do anything like that. I would have already heard about it if something like that was going to take place, but that's not the case. So young Jonathan, young David, one time they begin to think about what they might do, what David says to Jonathan. I'll tell you how we can tell. Because the king was going to have a big dinner and he was going to have all of his generals and all his people sitting at the table with him. And David said, Jonathan, when you go, would you have this meal? I'm supposed to be there, but I'm not going to come the first day. And I'm not going to come the second day. And if, if your dad says anything about my, about my not being there and what he's going to do, then let's work out some kind of deal here that I will know to go on and flee or to come back in and have fellowship with your family. So here's what he says. He said, David says, uh, Jonathan said, well, I'll go on in and talk to Dad. If I see that Dad doesn't have a problem, I will meet you. You hide and I'll meet you. I'll bring a guy out with some bow and arrow. And if he shoots way over and I tell him, I think you're way over, go look a little farther. You go on and don't come back. Just stay running. But if I tell you that make a, make a ride, it's just back there behind you somewhere, then you'll know to come on back into my father's house that there's nothing wrong. But Jonathan's a little concerned here because, and so is David, because here's where we talk about the covenant. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to tell this story and to bring you up to Jonathan and David and to talk about Jesus and the covenant in Luke 22 if we don't talk about a covenant that was made right here with David and Jonathan because Jonathan and David made a covenant with one another. Jonathan knew that David was going to be a king in the future and usually... If a king took over, he killed all of the former king's family. Everybody was killed, murdered, nobody was left alive because if something was to happen to David when he was king, then Saul's family could come back up and take the kingship and, and go ahead and rule again. Well, that wasn't going to happen if a covenant was made with two people that really believed in the covenant that they were making. I can see David and Jonathan as they describe the covenant, and David says, I will, when I become king, I'll remember... Your family forever. 
I will show kindness to your family forever, to your sons forever. I will always remember this. Jonathan knew that this is what David said. If something happens to me and if something happens to dad and you become king, just remember my family. David said, I, I promise you I will. But in a covenant being made, usually there's something about a covenant being made. And a covenant actually means the idea of cutting. The idea of cutting. Two people can be talking about something and they begin to cut out the contract. If In our modern day, it would be we would sit down and we would agree. If someone would read it to you and I, or they would to me, you may not have to have it read to you. I would have to know it and probably have to read it again time or two to understand all the terms of the contract before I sign my name to it. But a thousand years before Christ, it was done with blood. And so we're going to carry this right on up to Jesus. So I can imagine Jonathan and David that day as they might have, you know, like two young boys would sometimes would do. I, maybe they cut their fingers a little bit and touched each other and said, okay, this, this covenant is ratified now because the blood has been shed and we've shared each other's blood. And so the, the covenant's been ratified for this. But a covenant, it means the cutting. The idea of cutting to pass between the divided parts. I think that is where we go back to the book of Genesis and we get a little more information. In the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verse 17, when God made a covenant with Abraham, he literally, Abraham took an animal and he cut it in two. He shed its blood, he cut the animal in two. He laid one on one side, one piece, and the other piece on the other side. And the two were to walk between those two pieces, one going one direction. I would start here, the other one start there, and we'd meet somewhere in the middle. And by the time we got to the end, I no doubt would turn around to ratify the covenant, walking between the pieces, looking at one another. The covenant had been made, and that we were now satisfied with it. This is what God done in Genesis 15, 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Now that's God the Father and God the Son that crossed between those two pieces. You say, well, where was Abraham? As you well know, Abraham had... God had put a deep sleep on him and he made a covenant with himself that is an everlasting covenant. Now that covenant was a covenant made with Abraham and all of his seed. You say, oh, but I don't understand that. How does that have to do with me? It has to do with you and I now after we look into the scriptures with the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Galatia when he says that Christ, in Christ, we are that seed. So now, the, the covenant that Christ made with God the Father at the cross we are that promised seed now in the covenant, okay? But now, when I go back now to, if we go back to just for a minute and mention Luke 22, Jesus then is saying here, this is the blood of the new covenant. The new covenant in blood, I think is the way Luke reads it. Matthew would say this is the, new, this is the blood in the, in the new covenant, or the new testament. So, when Jesus says, take and, and eat and drink, drink this cup, he's saying, my blood ratifies a new covenant. But the blood hadn't been shed yet, though. But the blood would be shed on Calvary's cross, which would ratify the new covenant. Now, so I want to talk about the blood a minute, because we used to sing an old song in the church, there is power, power, wonder-working power. In the blood of the Lamb. And that's, that's all right, but a theology, in theology that may not be correct because the power of rest, if you would, in the Holy Spirit. The Bible promises that, that the Spirit would give us power, but it nowhere really says that the blood gives us power. The blood ratifies. Now there is a couple of scriptures that will explain the blood. For number one, that this is in the flesh. The life of the blood is in the flesh. The life of the flesh is in the blood, rather. We have life because blood flows through our veins. Let a man lose all of his blood. In fact, earlier years, there used to be what they call bloodletting. They thought that if you could get enough blood out of a human body, just enough to keep them from dying, that if they had any type of disease, 
that it would possibly flow out and then the, the body could regain its blood in just a few days or whatever. And this is what they really believe because, and I guess there's a lot of validity to it. And then there's the scripture in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But if we stopped right there talking about the blood, we may not get the significance of the blood if we don't go back to even the book of Exodus chapter 12. Without going back and reading the whole story, I'll relate it to you because in Exodus chapter 12, we're at the end of a period of time where God's people have been in bondage to uh, Pharaoh and Egypt. And many plagues have already happened and many of the signs that God is trying to change Pharaoh's mind has took place. And this last one will be that uh, they're going to do that the firstborn of every family will die. The firstborn of being the male you know, of every family will pass away this particular night when the death angel comes and moves over the land of Egypt. It doesn't just mean uh, the children of Egypt. It also means everyone. So we read in Exodus 12 that the Lord instructed the people in Israel. He said, I want you to kill a lamb and I want you to shed its blood and take the blood and I want you to apply it to the doorpost and the door mantle. Now, if you can imagine it, that's the doorpost on that door. That's the mantle, the top part. Now, here is what they would do. would go outside, apply the blood, the lamb that they had killed. What's the significance of the blood, though? The, the blood here, the significance was that, the, that God told me, He said, when you do this, when, you, when the angel sees that blood, he'll pass over your house. That's great because in that same symbolic time that Jesus is sitting here with his disciples and he's taking this cup and drinking it and saying this is the blood of the new covenant because he just said the cup that I drank in this Passover, he said I won't do it no more because the kingdom of God. And the bread that, we, that we're breaking or the food that we're eating, he said there will be no more need of doing this because uh, I'm going to uh, do away with it here in just a moment. He doesn't say it, but he does say it. I'm going to do away with this Passover meal. And every day they walk by, and I've got to throw this in here because this is kind of like one of those things that I have to. Every day that they walked in the city of Jerusalem, they seen that temple. And they could smell the smell of, of blood. Every day they could, they could walk by and they could smell the blood. They knew the blood was being shed and Jesus knew that this was just something that was a type of him being standing there and seeing all this, that when I, once he would go to the cross and shed his own blood, there would be no more need of killing animals, shedding its blood, and the blood is significant that I'm going to shed, that will wash men's sins away and they will never have to give another sacrifice. Oh, don't you wish that... Uh, and I'm going to say this, I hope that I don't step on anything or whatever. Don't you wish that, that people that still believe in Judaism or still believe in the old covenant, that they could believe that Christ's blood was enough? Even if they could believe that He was the Christ. You know, some people still have trouble believing that Jesus is the Christ. That they're still looking for another. But... Here they are amongst all of this Judaism, this religion that was going on, and Jesus saying, there won't be another Passover meal next year at this time. Not with you disciples. There may be others the years gone by, and there would be to AD 70 probably until the temple would be destroyed and, and the city of Jerusalem, would the walls would be torn down and no longer would there be need to be it. But there would several, be several that would be doing this and there probably would be some now and probably some still are. Because these words of Jesus, take and drink, this is my blood. But what does all of this mean to me, preacher? Well... Let's look at a few things else in the blood. In Romans 3.25, let's go to the New Testament here. Romans 3.25. Paul will then lay out a case for the blood of Jesus. Now this is, this is post-Calvary, post post-resurrection. And he says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 25 whom God set forth as, as a propitiation. 
God set forth as a propitiation. That is, in other words, the mercy seat. Do you see the symbolism here? When the temple was destroyed, there was no longer an Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant was never found even in the temple when Jesus was standing there in Jerusalem. The Ark had not been found. And so they had more or less pretended, I suppose, that, that it was there because I believe if I've got the right person right in my mind that when Herod finally got in the city and got in the temple and he got into the Holy of Holies and found there was no Ark there, he could not believe that the Jewish people had all these, those years that he had knew them, had worshipped and there was no ark there that they had been made to believe that there was still an ark in there and there was no ark there. It had been gone for quite some time. But on the ark of the covenant was the mercy seat. The mercy seats were the blood when once the priest would kill the sacrifice that he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and the cherubims as they looked down upon the mercy seat as the two cherubims, winged cherubims, looked continually down on the mercy seat, all they could see was the blood, the propitiation, the mercy seat. All they could see was the blood. All God could see was the blood. Now, can we bring that symbolism in now a little bit closer to where we're at? When God looks down, the significance then of the blood is that the blood still is the atonement. It still is. Because here's what Paul says here. That the, whom God set forth as a propit by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over that, the sins that were previously committed. How about that? Let's go to the fifth chapter. Verse 9. Justification. One of my favorite subjects. Romans 5, uh, 9, much more than having now been justified, been may, having a standing of righteousness where before you did not have, but because belief in Christ and what He did on the cross and shedding His blood there and resurrecting the third day, now we can stand in justification. And He said, much more than having now been justified by His blood we shall be saved from wrath through Him. That's the blood. The covenant. The blood. Then let's go a little farther. Let's go to the book of Colossians. We have not only propitiation, that covering, not only do we have justification, that right standing with God, but ladies and gentlemen, we also have peace. Peace through the blood. Scripture tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Tells us exactly where peace was made. What's it mean? It means that through the blood of Christ, the shedding of this blood, that God reconciled the world to Himself. Now, we know that several years existed where disobedience reigned in man because of the giving of the law. The only reason, and I think you, you can see it very clear in the book of, of Exodus, chapter 19, where God asked them what they, you know, about the covenant that, of Abraham or whether they, he wanted to make a new covenant with them. And they, he, and they said, well, whatever you say for us to do, we will do that. Well, it kind of reminds me of one of my cousins one time that promised the Lord he'd never smoke another cigarette. Have you ever promised the Lord you'd never do something? It's not good when you do because most of the time you'll end up doing something or doing the very thing you promise him you won't do because it's not, God's not one that we can make deals with. I find that it's best for me to live by faith rather than by my sight. My cousin said, I'll never smoke another, I, don't, uh, I won't never smoke another cigarette, God. And he promised the Lord he wouldn't. He, then after it was all said and done and he went through about three years of, of a smoker's 
addiction that he wanted a cigarette every day for, for three years nearly in his life. He said, I'll never promise God anything else. And he said, that was the biggest promise I'd ever made and I learned my lesson to never do such again. Well, see, God reconciles. We don't have to try to make promises. You say, what do you mean? We don't have to try to make promises. We've been reconciled to God. You, know, I, you say, well, I don't quite understand. Well, to be reconciled means that he has now made peace with mankind. He has made peace through the blood of, of the cross, through what Jesus, the blood Jesus shed at the cross. Peace has been made with man. God no longer. This is, this is where I have to stand and defend when someone thinks God is mad and say, wait a minute, is it God that's mad that's doing these things? You mean God's in heaven making bad things happen to you because you did something wrong and God's doing something because He's mad or He's took a son or a daughter or He's, you've had this accident and now that you can't work and you're unemployed and everything's going wrong that God somehow or another is trying to get your attention through the bad things that's happening in your life. I believe that if I've read this right that God reconciled the world to Himself through the blood of Christ, through the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. You say, but I don't understand. What is it? If you please, I don't mean to be um, egotistical, but what is it about that that is, is difficult for us to understand or more than anything else to accept? The fact that God no longer is angry, that He reconciled the world, that the peace now that exists is because of what Christ did there and not it's because of the blood of Christ that we now have peace with God. You say, well, I don't have peace with God. It may be then, if you please, that you don't know Christ His Son or believe in Christ His Son or believe that He is the only begotten of the Father. The covenant. The blood. Let's don't stop there. Let's look at a few more because Paul speaks quite often of it. Let's look in Ephesians 2. If you have your Bible, let's just go... Back a book. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through verse 13. Reading here, this, this is where we were brought nigh by the blood of Jesus. Here's what Paul says right into the church at Ephesus. Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, say now. <laughs> Sounds pretty. Now, see. But now in Christ Jesus... You who were once far off have been brought nigh by the blood of Christ. So you've been brought in because of the blood of Jesus. Let's look at one more. And this kind of takes my mind back to... Um, it takes my mind back to the time of the temple. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. A very interesting passage of scripture. Revelation 12, 11. Well, a lot of times, and I've used this scripture, I think maybe out of context a few times, but if we keep it in its context, this tells us if you read this particular chapter, there was time that there was war in heaven. And the dragon was throughout. The dragon meaning Satan was throughout. Jesus said one time in his ministry here, he said to the disciples, he said, I beheld Satan cast out as lightning to the earth. Like a streak of lightning is you see it bolt out and it, you, don't, you, know, you can count the 1,001 and 1,000 whatever on back and you, you can kind of tell how far it's off. I don't even have time sometimes to count that, even that, and that tells you it's right there on you. It kind of tells you how far it's off when you can do that. Well, Jesus said, I remember when he was cast out. And I always took it that it'd be a futuristic event that Satan would be cast out of heaven, that right now, somewhere in the Egon's of past, that Satan was cast out but that he dwells in the heavenlies right now. Well, 
I'm not going to get into all that, but I want to read this to you because here's what this says. And if, if this is a revelation according to the, to the title of this book, the revelation of John? No. Very astute. But the revelation of Christ to John. It's the revelation of Christ to John. Here's what, here's what this book says in verse 11. And they overcame him. Who's they? This will be someone that's going through all kinds of problems and trouble. Can we take our mind back to AD 70 for a minute? I think the greatest injustice has been done to us as a church to not know the history of what happened in those last three or four years of Israel's or Jerusalem's existence. When you begin to read a little bit of the history about it, you find out what happened in those three years, those last three years, 67, 68, 69, 70, 68, 69, and 70. And you read of how 1.1 million Jews were killed, not just in the city of Jerusalem alone, but all around about. Whenever that uh, Rome was going from city to city and they were killing Jews by the hundreds, slaughtered by the hundreds, it takes a lot of bodies to build up a 1.1 million people. That's a lot of people to die in just a few years period of time. That would make the eagles and the vultures come and gather together in the fields to eat up those dead bodies, if you please. But if we can think about this for a minute, they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus, when He was here, He told, he told everyone, He said, this thing is at hand. When you see certain things happen, flee Jerusalem. Get out, of, get out of here. When you see the temple here, run over with idolatry. When you see the desolation of abomination spoken of by Daniel, when you see it, get out of here. Now, that's just one part of it. You can continue to think that there's another temple going to be built. It won't affect me whatsoever. And I'm not telling you my way is the only way, but I'm just trying to, to show you maybe this is what he's talking about here. But here's how they overcame him by the, word of, by the blood of the Lamb. It looks like that there was a time where somebody overcame the evil one and the, what was going on by the blood of the Lamb. They, did they plead the blood? I think so, because the blood of the Lamb was what ratified the fact that they had, were under a new covenant with better promises. And now here they are standing, and by the word of their testimony. They, didn't, they weren't silent Christians. They weren't secret service Christians. They were Christians that said, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we're not ashamed of it. They knew the blood is what was shed for their sins. For the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So the blood was shed for them. 1 John chapter 1 will tell us this, that the blood washes sins away. That the blood continues to wash sins away. That is a phenomenal statement talking about the covenant and the blood. So we see now why David and Jonathan are standing out here in the field making a covenant with one another and taking the blood and applying it to each other because it then points to what Christ would then do at the cross with He and the Father. As He and the Father would go between the fact that He was crucified on the cross and that meant He shed His blood and you could almost say the fact that He and the Father was walking between the pieces as Christ died upon the cross, God made a covenant. He said when He couldn't make a covenant with no greater, He made one with Himself. Himself being His Son Jesus that He made a covenant with. So there won't be any more breaking of a covenant no more. Not in the new covenant, ladies and gentlemen. But I want to read to you out of the book of Hebrews before I get through here. I want to read to you about the new covenant. If you've never took time to just look and see. Now, uh, in Hebrews chapter 8 is where we're going to see the new covenant spoke about. Now, we know the old covenant was based with blood. It was a blood covenant as well because we've established that with Abraham. Could have talked about Noah. We've established it with, with shortly, a little bit with David and Jonathan. But we could go on with Moses, but it would take too much time and I may be already about running out of time. I'm not sure. But anyway, let's look now at the new covenant. The terms of it we'll talk about later. We may not get to the inheritance tonight, but that's really the part I would like to just kind of dig around in 
because there's some more story about David and Jonathan that is worthy to mention. If a covenant's been made, and here you're sitting here tonight, and you don't have any idea what it all means to you, and you don't even have any idea what your inheritance is, and you're still living as if you don't have anything new happening in your life. It may be because, and I don't mean this derogatory in any way, because most, probably all of you are probably smarter than I am, but if we walk in ignorance of who we are in Christ, it means that we walk in a lot of negative things in our life as well. You know, you could probably be the smartest person in the world and still be walking in ignorance of the covenant, if you please. And I don't mean that derogatory, and forgive me, I don't know any other better way to say it. Um, but let's, let's, let me do some reading. That'll, I'll be better off if I do that and not probably say too terribly much here on all of this. So, Hebrews 8 verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless. Now this is out of your Bible. It's out of the book of Hebrews. Then no place would have been sought for a second. Wow. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now, i got to stop here because, see, we're not just blowing in the wind when we talk about the covenant that that Abraham made is not the same covenant that was made with Moses. And we know for by fact that this is not talking about the Abraham covenant. We know that because of the language here, this is talking about the covenant that was made when Moses was standing there in the 19th chapter of Exodus and in the 20th chapter, and how that when the commandments was given, the people said, whatever God says, whatever He tells us to do, we'll do that. And God said, okay. So he goes up and he writes Ten Commandments and gives it to them. They couldn't do it. Nor can you and I do it if we try to do this on our own. So this is what he's talking about, right? I mean, really. I mean, I mean, that's what I'm seeing out of this. Not according, verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. That's the Lord's prerogative. They broke the covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. I will put my laws in their mind. Okay? Now where's the law going to be? It's in your mind. So you don't have to have this out here that reads, Thou shalt not. It's in your mind. You already know this. Somebody asked me here a while back, what about the laws? Should we ignore the Ten Commandments? What does it say? And I'll just answer that with this scripture. What does it say here? I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. This is the new covenant. And I will be their God and they shall be my people None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of his brothers saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now that, and I haven't got a hold of yet, that's, that's phenomenal. They'll all know me, from the least to the greatest. I, I'm kind of one of these guys that it's hard for me to cut scriptures out that I don't quite understand. Well, here's one I don't quite understand, because it doesn't look to me like everybody knows him. You know, but he said here, I think as anybody wants to know him, wants to know this peace, wants to know this propitiation, but then I speculate there, don't I? But uh, from the least unto the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now this is another part of this covenant. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. In other words, the things that they keep doing wrong. And he said, I'm going to write it in your mind, I'm going to put it in your heart, but I will be merciful and to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Well, in that day, he says, a new covenant he has made the first 
obsolete now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now this is why I keep going back to that temple. What is here, what has been here, is fixing to vanish away. And everything about the old covenant and everything about the system of the old covenant vanishes away in AD 70. And there's no longer a temple and they no longer are going to take animals to a temple and they're no longer going to be sacrificing in the temple. And now for all these years, for nearly 2,000 years, everybody has been had the same privilege. Everybody's had the same high priest. Everybody's had the same opportunity to come to the throne of grace to the, and find mercy and f to find grace to help in the time of need. It doesn't make any difference if you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're red, yellow, black, or white. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is or was. You have the same privilege, the same right to come to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and to make your peace-calling election sure. And just uh, to, to continue with this a little bit, we'll go a little farther in Hebrews and then I'll close. And I'll have to come back since Paul's given me two weeks here. <laughs> I'll just come back next week and finish up about the inheritance because there's some things that needs to be said concerning it too. Hebrews 12, 24, the scripture says this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And let's look at one more of Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead and that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Kindly, kindly put your thinking around that, the blood of the everlasting covenant. That blood that Christ shed there. So every time we take communion, it's kind of... I know we've, we've put a lot of significance... On, on the communion, or we do now more so than, than I probably ever did in my Christian life. I, I've took communion all of my Christian life in the church I was raised in, which I'm not saying anything derogatory about it, but we, we had communion maybe once or twice a year, and we always attached to that foot washing. We had communion and foot washing. And, we, you know, I was one of those, not only as a minister that would do this, but I was a recipient sitting in the pews where the ministers would say you need to examine yourself and see if there's anything about your life that's not right and maybe someone you haven't been good to this week or something you've said or done that's not right before you take this communion service because if you don't you know, judge yourself and, and get yourself straightened up, you could bring damnation upon your own self. Well, it was kind of liberating to me. It was great to know that it's not necessarily that that he's talking to us about in 1 Corinthians 11, that we need to examine ourselves whether we're in the faith or not, or whether we've done something wrong or not. But it's really rather, when I take the communion, the bread, and I take the cup, that I'm realizing what it is and the significance of the blood and the significance of his broken body for me to be in the place where I needed to be because, you know, um, in a closing remark on, on the scripture that we started out with here. And uh, thinking about it just one more time, and we would have to think what that would make in reference to the scripture where Jesus said the blood of the new covenant. That Peter would later write in, in 1 Peter 2 verse 24, where he would say, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. It, it encompasses it all of the communion service. I know that Peter wasn't talking about taking the communion. He wasn't that at all. But when we talk about the covenant, the blood, and the inheritance, I think we've covered something that might spark our minds to think about the covenant that we have. And, and I think it's going to be interesting, I hope, 
when I, now we talk about the inheritance because I really would like to know sometimes what have I really inherited? And if I do have something, am I far from walking in the inheritance that's mine through covenant, through the shed blood? I understand the covenant that's been made between God and His Son, and I know that I'm adopted into this family. And I covered that in a sermon that i done here a while back about being heirs or being joint heirs or being in the family, being adopted into the family, being the Son of God, not just a slave, but a son. And I know that and I realize that. And I don't talk to my father as if I'm a slave either. I talk to him as I'm a son. And I, I, I like to believe the fact that Christ is in me, the hope of glory, that when he looks at me, he doesn't see me, he sees his son in me. Now that's phenomenal, folks. Because if you're like me, you think, well, I don't know that he would really be happy with everything I say and do. <laughs> and you probably feel the same way. But if he's looking at his son... He, how can he overlook me and see his son because his son is in me? You know. That's hard to get a, to wrap everything around in it and get that idea in your mind that he's, that he's in us. You say, well, he's actually in heaven. He's not in us. No, not according to the scripture. I know what you say, well, that's hard to believe. Well, God is omnipresent. He can be anywhere at all times at any, at any time and any place. So, he is in you, and He's the hope of your glory. And Throughout the church world, believers long to be victorious over sin, the flesh, and the devil. Christ's death on the cross provided us with all the tools we need to walk in perpetual victory and to experience the abundant life. Pastor Paul White closely examines the armor of God that Ephesians 6 tells us to put on in this seven-sermon series titled, The Whole Armor of God. Prepare for a fascinating journey into the believer's warfare with powerful sermons such as The Breastplate of Righteousness, Wearing the Shoes of God's Peace, and The Sword of the Spirit, God's Spoken Word. This series can be yours for the price of only $30 plus shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.com. More information about Paul White Ministries and how you can become one of Paul's partners, visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. That's www.paulwhiteministries.org. Have a blessed day and may God richly bless you.